All right, let's move on. We started with the carbonyls in the last class, and we determined that when an element has an even number of electrons, then our carbonyl will be a simple um, carbonyl with one metal in the center and the number of um, carbonyl ligands around that metal and how many ligands will, there will be will depend on well, how many ligands are needed in order to fulfill the adenine electron rule. And we have applied this in the last class to the elements chromium, molybdenum, and tungsten, which have six electrons. So we have determined that In order to need, in order to get 18 electrons, because the metal has six electrons, we have zero charge. The number of ligand electrons is 12. And that means that the number of ligands needed is six. So we would expect uh, hexacarbonyls and they are octahedral because the octahedral shape is the shape in which all the ligands have the greatest distance. These are all stable sublimable um, solids. So now, can you also make um, octahedral carbonyls with other metals too that fulfill the 18 electron rule? And the answer is yes, you just have to adjust uh, the charge so that again you have 18 um, valence electrons. So, um, for instance, if you go from the chromium to the vanadium, then the vanadium has one electron less than the chromium. So in order to make a hexacarbonyl, which has a, which has 18 electrons, you will have to add one negative charge in order to achieve 18 electrons. And so the respective state of species would be the vanadium hexacarbonyl one minus. Okay, now we can do this also for the higher homologs. Um, so <clears throat> niobium and tantalum are underneath the vanadium in the periodic table. So therefore, we would, we would expect also a, a niobium hexacarbonyl minus, which is stable, and a tantalum hexacarbonyl minus, which is stable. And they're all known species. Okay, so now you can, of course, go further with this and go from the vanadium to the titanium. So the titanium has two electrons less than the chromium, therefore the respective factor carbonyl will have a two negative charge. And indeed, this is known to be a stable species. So again, also the higher homologs are known as a chromium hexacarbonyl two minus and the hafnium hexacarbonyl two minus. Okay, can we also go into the other direction? Um, so next to the chromium, there's the the manganese to the right in the parent table, the manganese is one electron more than the chromium. So hexacarbonyl of manganese would need to have a one plus positive charge in order to have 80 electrons and be stable and indeed such a carbonyl is known. So now what about the higher homologues that would be the magnesium and the rhenium they are also both known as a, a cation with a one plus charge. So now we can go further to the right of the product table and go from the uh, manganese um, to the iron. So the iron has two electrons more than the chromium. So therefore, in order to achieve it, to achieve 18 electrons, the carbonyl would have to have a two plus positive charge. So again, such a carbonyl is known and also the higher homologs, the ruthenium and the osmium hexacarbonyl are known. Okay, now can we drive this even further? We could go from the iron to the cobalt, which has another additional electron, and the um, hexacarbonyl should then uh, have a three plus charge. However, this um, uh, compound is, is not known. Um, <clears throat> this follows a general trend that uh, carbonylates with highly negative charges 
can be easily achieved, but carbonyls with high positive charges uh, tend to be unstable. And this now is because of what we have learned previously, the, it's because of this strength of the pi back bonding due to the pi acceptor interactions of the carbonyl ligand. So um, as we have a carbonyl, when we have a carbonyl with a, with a negative charge, then that increases the uh, pi back bonding and that increases the bond order between the metal and the carbon. Okay, that goes at the expense of the bond order between the carbon and the oxygen, but the, the, this bond strength between the carbon and oxygen is always high enough so that the, the carbon fragment doesn't, doesn't fall apart, but the, the strength of the carbon metal bond is more sensitive. The higher the bond order, the stronger the bond. So therefore, highly negatively charged carbonylates are often, are often quite stable. But uh, uh, carbonyl cations uh, become unstable because you destabilize the, the, the pi acceptor interactions that decreases the bond order and that can happen to an extent until the uh, entire carbonyl is no longer stable. So for that reason, the cobalt hexacarbonyl 3 plus is not known. Uh, the rhodium is also not known. The iridium is still still known, but it's it's uh, not a particular stable compound either. All right, so now how can we actually um, observe the um, pi acceptor interactions? And you can observe them indirectly via the um, carbon oxygen stretch vibration when you take an, uh, an IR. Yeah, you can use infrared spectroscopy in order to show um, that um, the pi acceptor interactions um, decrease as you go from highly negatively charged uh, carbonylates to neutral carbonylates to positive carbonylates. And you see this here, um, when you compare the respective species, so we see that for, sorry, for the titanium hexacarbonyl to minus, the CO stretch vibration has the smallest wave number. So that refers to the smallest bond order between the carbon and the oxygen, which relates to the greatest bond order between the carbon and the metal. Okay, you see that the CO stretch vibration increases in strength, so increases in wave number um, as you go from the titanium to the vanadium, which is only one minus charge, then to the neutral pure hexacarbonyl, and then to the manganese compound, the iron compound. And of course, the respective cobalt compound can't be measured because it doesn't, doesn't exist. But for the iron compound here, you measure the highest uh, wave number that relates to the highest bond order in the carbon oxygen, in the carbon and the oxygen. It relates to the lowest bond order uh, between the carbon and the metal. All right, so now let's go from the group six to the group eight. So in the group eight, we have the iron, the ruthenium, and the osmium. They have eight valence electrons. So how many electrons do we need to achieve 18 electrons? Well, the metal has eight. We need another 10 because again, we assume that the charge is zero. Um, and if each carbonyl contributes two, electrons, then that means that we need five carbonyl ligands and our carbonyls should be pentacarbonyls. This is exactly also what is observed for iron with the in osmium. So these molecules adopt the trigonal um, by pyramidal shape and they are actually liquids. So the iron hexacarbon is a light orange liquid. The ruthenium, the osmium, Hexacarbonyl, uh, so pentacarbonyls are colorless liquids uh, because 
the absorbed light is no longer in the visible but all in the UV. Okay. Remember, uh, metals in a higher field tend to produce larger delta values. Okay, um, so now again, what charged uh, versions with other elements would be possible? Well, again, we can go first to the left in the paddock table. So left to the iron is the manganese. So the manganese is one electron less. So we have to add an electron to the pentacarbon and that gives you a manganese CO5 minus. So again, the higher homologs are also known. So if you go further to the left, then we arrive at the chromium. The chromium has two electrons less than the iron, so we need to add two electrons and the respective carbonylate has then a two negative charge. And the higher homologues um, also exist. So we can even go further to the left to the vanadium, which has a highly negative charge, a three minus charge, because it is another electron less. Again, the higher homologues are known. So we can now also go the other direction from the iron to the cobalt. So the cobalt has one electron more than the iron. So the respective pentacarbonylate has to have a one plus charge. That's not a very high positive charge. So our carbonyl cation is therefore stable, or the higher homologues are stable. But if we go further from the cobalt to the nickel, then the respective species are no longer stable because in this case we need a two plus positive charge, which in this case is already, which is already too, too high. So neither nickel nor the palladium nor the platinum pentacarbonyl cations are no. Okay, now let's just continue with this systematically. Let's go to the group 10. So in the group 10, we have the nickel, the palladium, and the platinum. So they have how many valence electrons? 10, because they are in the group 10. So how many ligands do we need to get to 18 electrons? Well, we need an additional eight electrons. Yeah. And again, each carbonyl ligand contributes two, so that gives eight over two, that's four. So we expect tetracarbonyls. And these tetracarbonyls adopt a tetrahedral shape, okay? Not a square planar shape because they are 18 electron species, okay? Only 16 electron species would prefer the square planar shape. All right, so now, uh, Tetracarbonyl is a colorless liquid, which is very volatile. You've got to know it when you discuss the mold process. The higher uh, ana analogs um, are um, already unstable. We can explain this by the fact that the orbital overlap between um, the um, metal and the ligand uh, is less effective as we go to higher peered metals because the higher peered metals have significantly larger orbitals. In addition to that, the, the tetrahedral shape is not very ideal for the pi back bonding, okay? Because like I asked you in the exam, the tetrahedral shape does not allow for ideal pi, pi orbit overlap. So the pi orbit overlap is less effective. So the important pi back bonding is less effective when the uh, uh, molecule is, is tetrahedral and that tends to destabilize the respective, the respective species. Okay, um, now can we also make charge species using other metals? So again, it's easy to make carbonylates because that actually strengthens the bond border between the carbon and the metal. So if we go from nickel to the cobalt, and the cobalt has one electron less, and our respective carbonyl has to have one negative charge. Um, for the iron, we need two negative charges that can also easily be done. For the manganese, we need three negative charges, although this carbonylate is stable. For the chromium, we need even 
four positive charges is still stable, yeah, despite the high negative charge, uh, because we increase the pipe the strength of the pipe at home. Okay, also the higher homologs are stable. However, um, when we go to the cationic side, we are much more limited. So the copper carbonyl, pitter carbonyl plus, still stable, but the higher homologs uh, are again not stable and no uh, carbonyls of the zinc are known because the zinc would require a two plus charge and that's just all I apply. Okay, so now overall, we can determine the following trends with regard to the stabilities of the, of the carbonyls. Um, as we go from the hexacarbonyls to the pentacarbonyls to the tetracarbonyls, the stability tends to, tends to decrease. And that is because the shape becomes increasing, increasingly unfavorable for the pi, pi back bonding. So octahedral is, octahedral is best. Okay, we can make ideal, ideal pi bonds. Um, the trigonal bipyramidal shape is already not, not, not quite as, uh, quite as good. But um, the tetrahedral shape is, 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 is the worst. Okay, um, and uh, the second trend is the stability tends to decrease with, with a period, and we can explain this by the fact that the metal orbitals become larger and larger, and the overlap with the relatively small orbitals of the carbon ligand becomes increasingly, increasingly ineffective. Okay. So finally, we could also look at the group four and the group 12 carbonyls. We realize that there are no carbonyls for these metals. Can you imagine why this may be? Let's go maybe first to the group four. How many ligands would we need? Sorry? Seven ligands. Okay, good. So that would require a coordination number of seven. And that coordination number of seven is too high for covenants. Okay, so due to a too high of coordination number, group four covenants do not exist. So what about group 12? How many ligands would we need? How many? Three, yeah, that's correct. And such a low coordination, and that's a low coordination number, which is also generally not very, uh, very favorable. <clears throat> okay, so for group four, seven ligands would be needed, coordination numbers too high. For group 12, three ligands would be needed, and that's a coordination number too low. Okay. Then um, let us move on here. And go the carbonyls of metals that have an odd number of <coughs> electrons. We can for instance start in the seventh group. In the seventh group, um, we find the manganese, the technetium, and the rhenium. So now I said, that those um, metals tend to make 17 valence electron species. So they try to get as close as possible to 18, but they can't just because they are an odd number. And then the species dimerize, and then formally, still every metal is being surrounded by 18, 18 electrons. Okay, so in the sum, we need 17 valence electrons. So the metal in this case has seven. So we need another 10 because the charge is zero. And that means we need how many ligands? Uh, that will be five, correct. The 
just 10 over two, and that's equal to five. Okay, so now we therefore would expect two pentacarbonyl species that dimerize, okay, making a metal metal bond in between them. And this is exactly what happens in this case and for the for the manganese, we get a manganese manganese bond. And each manganese is surrounded by five um, CO ligands. So overall, the manganese is octahedral coordinated. Okay, by five CO ligands and uh, the second second manganese. So we have um, therefore equatorial ligands and actual ligands. We have here two actual ligands, and here we have four equatorial ligands for all our uh, two manganese atoms. And that gives two squares. These squares are uh, rotated by 45 degrees relative to each other in order to minimize the sterical piling between the two carbonyl, two carbonyl ligands. So this determines the overall shape of the respective compounds. Okay. So now can we can make charged species? So now if you go from the manganese to the left in the periodic table, to the left in the periodic table, there would be um, the chromium, right? Um, but first of all, there are no, before we go to the examples, we can say that there are no highly charged binuclear carbonate anions, and there are no binuclear carbonate cations. Okay, so only weakly uh, charged uh, carbonyl, carbonylates are, <clears throat> are allowed. So there's a difference to the um, carbonyls with metals having an even number of electrons where also high negative charges were allowed. So now the reason why no high negative charges for the dimeric carbonates are allowed is because when we accumulate too many negative charges on the metal, then that weakens the metal-metal bond, okay? While, it's, while it still strengthens the metal-carbon bond, we also now have to consider the strength of the metal-metal bond and because of well, it's static repulsion because of the high negative charge on the on the two metals. Uh, so the metal metal bond is destabilized. So we we cannot accept any positive positive charges on uh, the carbonyls. Firstly, again because it destabilizes the carbon metal bond, but also the positive two positive charges. Well, two positive charges would destabilize the the metal metal bond and both effects all together prevent any positively charged carbonates to, to be stable. All right, so basically the only charged species that are known are the, are the chromium uh, decacarbonyl, the dichromium decacarbonyl to minus. So um, the chromium has one more electron than the manganese, but we have two chromiums. Sorry, the chromium has one electron. The chromium has one electron less than the manganese. Okay, and we have two chromiums. We have two electrons less. So therefore, we must add these two electrons as charges. So that gives the respective dimeric compound a two minus negative negative charge. So that negative charge is still small enough so that the chrome, chrome uh, double bond is still stable. The higher homologues, the molybdenum and the tungsten compound, they are also they are also known. Okay, but no other charge species. Are known. All right, then let's go from the seventh to the ninth group. Um, in the ninth group, we have the cobalt, the rhodium, and the iridium. So they have nine valence electrons. So how many electrons do we need to get to 17? So the metal has nine. So it charges again zero. So the difference between nine and seven, well, that is eight. 
So how many carbonyls do we need? Well, that's eight divided by two, that's four. Okay. So we would expect that there are two tetracarbonyl 17 valence, 17 valence electron fragments that that dimerize. That's that's exactly that's exactly the case. Um, so you see here the structure of the cobalt um, carbonyl, and you see that the carbon cobalt is surrounded by well four carbonyls, and the second cobalt atom. So overall we have the coordination number five. So each cobalt is surrounded in a, a trigonal by pyramidal way. Okay. So again, we have axial and equatorial carbonyl. So these are the actual ones, and these are these two are the actual ones. And then we have here these three equatorial ones and these three equatorial ones. So again, because of minimization of steric expulsion. They are oriented in a staggered fashion. They are rotated by 60 degrees relative, relative to each other. So now, interestingly, though, this is not the only possible structure for the um, cobalt carbonyl. There's a second structure, which is in equilibrium with the structure in solution. Um, and this is this, this structure over here. And that again results from the fluxional behavior associated with the coordination number five that we previously already discussed when we discussed it by pseudo rotation. Okay, so again, because of uh, uh, the fluxional nature of uh, the, the structure, the, the CO ligands can, they, they can scramble. Okay. And now they cannot only scramble between actual equatorial positions, they can also scramble from one cobalt atom to the other through an intermediate, which is actually stable enough to be in chemical equilibrium with, with, this, with this original structure here. Okay, so uh, in this structure over there, okay, um, two of the carbonyls now are bridging the, the cobalt the cobalt atoms. Okay, you can easily imagine this to happen when you consider that um, statistically this this cobalt here could well bend to this direction, make an interaction with that cobalt for instance, and thereby becoming thereby becoming Merging. So the stability of this structure is partly also explained by the fact that when we have this carbonyl bridging, then we increase the coordination number from five to six. And a coordination number of six is generally better for carbonyls in comparison to a coordination number five. Okay. But of course, uh, once this carbonyl here is bridging, let's say it comes from the left cobalt. Through a cleavage of this cobalt carbon bond, it could also become part of the second cobalt scrambling over there. And then we would arrive at this uh, isomer again with the coordination number five. And this way, carbon ligands can scramble all the time back and, back and forth. So now, in solution, these species here <clears throat> are in equilibrium. Um, we need to crystallize this carbonyl from the solution then um, the right structure which has this uh, C to V symmetry by the way is uh, found to be more the more stable stable, stable structure or the, the exclusive structure so that indicates that the right structure is actually um, the more uh, <coughs> the more stable structure at least in the solid state Okay, um, so now in this case, the, the higher homologs, the rhodium and the iridium compounds, 
are not stable, it can again be explained by the fact that with these carbonyls, we have a lower coordination number, coordination number five, um, which is not as favorable as the coordination of six, which we have previously encountered for the group seven carbonyls. All right. So now, can we also have charged, charged species? The answer is again, yes, but only when the charge is modestly negative. So again, we cannot have highly charged by nuclear carbonylate anions. We cannot have any by nuclear carbonyl anions. So therefore, um, the only species that are known are the, the iron, Diiron octacarbonyl to minus. Okay. You go from carb, uh, cobalt to iron. We add, uh, so we remove one electron. Iron is one electron less. So because we have two irons, it's two electron less. So therefore, again, these okay, must have a two negative charge. So in this case, of the higher homologs, the ruthenium and the osmium are known. From that, you may conclude that the weakly negative charge is overall the best charge. Yeah. Um, it's actually even better than having no charge at all. Okay, so now what about the 11th group? So in the 11th group, we have the copper, the silver, the gold. So they have 11 electrons. So how many? Ligands do we need to achieve 17 valence electrons? So when the metal has 11 and the charge is zero, we need how many electrons? Well, six, right? Six. And the number of ligands is then six over two, which is equal to three. Okay. Um, so now we would expect um, a tricarbonyl fragment, which is which is dimerizing, okay, giving overall a coordination number of four around each uh, species. So um, you would expect a tetrahedral environment for each metal in this case. So um, now. The tetrahedral environment is even worse than the trigonal by pyramidal one. So therefore these carbonyls are even less, less stable. So actually do not know the neutral species that we would expect. The copper two CO6, the silver two CO6, that means to be a six and not a three. I'm sorry, this is a typo. And the gold two CO6. Okay. But again, a modestly negative charge has an overall stabilizing effect. So the nickel to CO6 2 minus is actually known as the only example of this group. So as you go from copper to the nickel, well, we have one electron less, we have two nickel, so it's two electron less. So they again have to have a two minus charge and then weakly negative charge is overall the best. Um, Solution. All right. So now again, we can establish stability trends, and the stability trends are the same as we previously observed. So as we go from the left to the right in the paddock table, stability decreases. We'll explain this because we go from octahedral to a trigonal by pyramidal to a tetrahedral environment, which um, provides less efficient orbital overlap for pi back bonding in that series. And we see also the stability decreases down, uh, down a particular uh, group. And again, that can be explained by less efficient orbital overlap because the heavier the metal, the less efficient it overlaps with the relatively small orbitals of the cluster. All right, so these were 
Oh yeah, we are not still not quite finished because <clears throat> we can also look at the fifth group. Let's not look at the fifth group yet. And we there have the native Niobium, the tantalum. So they have well only five valence electrons. So how do we need to get to 17? Well, we need uh, 12 electrons, so we need six ligands. Okay, and then we would expect that these ligands again dimerize, but in this case that doesn't happen because we would go from the coordination number six to the coordination number seven, which is highly unfavorable for covenant. And therefore, these species uh, prefer not to dimerize, but exist as 17 valence electron radical species. Or at least the vanadium does, the, the higher homologs are actually again already unstable. So we know the vanadium hexacarbonyl, which does not dimerize because the coordination number would become too high. So it exists as a dark violet radical of octahedral shape. So that means that the radical um, electron is actually sterically, sterically inactive. So this species is a good oxidant because it likes to take up an electron and become reduced because then it goes from 17 valence electrons to 18 valence and so can actually use it as an oxidant. All right, so like I said previously, the homologs, the niobium and the tantalum compounds are not known again. We can explain this by the less efficient orbit or like when the uh, size of the metal increases. All right, so there's a lot more to carbonyl chemistry. One can uh, make much more complex carbonyls, in particular carbonyl clusters. But in order to understand this chemistry, I would like to insert briefly another subchapter, which is about an important concept in chemistry, uh, the concept of isolability. So the concept of isolability helps us to understand more complex carbonates, but also helps us generally to understand the stability of uh, compounds. Okay, and that is very useful in synthesis when you want to um, think, think up um, target, target molecules and you need to estimate uh, will this target molecule likely be stable or not. All right. So now, what is the concept of isolability about? Um, the name actually comes from the Greek words um, isos, which is similar, and globos, which means lobe. Okay, so isolober means basically similar lobes. Okay, and the concept of isolability has been developed by Roald Hoffman, who uh, won the Nobel Prize. Um, in chemistry for this and other things in the year 1981. So basically the, the concept of isolability says that if we have two molecular fragments that have similar lobes, meaning that the number of symmetry properties, approximate energy and shape of quantity orbit, the number of electrons in them are similar, then they are isolobal and they can well overlap with each other or interact with each other to form a stable molecule. Okay. So the concept of isolability in a certain sense, therefore, also has to estimate well, will a chemical bond likely be stable or, or not? And if it's stable, the entire molecule will likely be stable. All right. So now this definition sounds uh, pretty complex because it says that molecular fragments are isolobal if the number symmetry properties approximate energy and shape of the quantity orbit and the number of electrons in them are similar. Okay, so when would that be the case? Sounds hard to determine, uh, but it's in practice often much easier than it sounds here because much can be derived from the octet rule, when you look at organic fragments, and the 18 electron rule, when you look at um, organometallic 
fragments, including um, carbonyl fragments. And this just looks as following the following. So let's start first with simple organic fragments or main group element element fragments. So the number of frontier orbitals in this case can be estimated to be equal to the number of electrons in the frontier orbitals, which is eight minus the valence electrons of the fragment. Okay, so for instance, when we have a CH3 fragment, then that's a seven valence electron fragment. Okay, so why is it seven valence electrons? Well, because um, we have the three carbon hydrogen bonds, so that gives six electrons. But the CH3 fragment is a, is a radical, yeah? Um, if you consider it a neutral species, so we have to have a seventh electron, a radical electron is carbon. Okay. And now the rule says that the number of frontier orbitals is equal to the number of electrons in the frontier orbitals is equal to eight minus the valence electron of the fragments. So eight minus the valence of the fragment is in this case eight minus seven, that gives one. Okay. So that means that we have one uh, frontier orbital with one electron in it. Okay, now we have determined the number of frontier orbitals and we have determined the number of electrons in these frontier orbitals. Okay, so it's just, just equal to eight minus the valence electron. So now we can do the same also for other fragments. So for instance, the NH2 fragment and the OH fragment, they are also seven valence electron fragments. Why? Well, for NH2, well, we have the four electrons <coughs> in the two NH bonds. Um, but in addition, we have also the electron lone pair at the nitrogen. Okay, so that gives six, but we need a seventh electron in order to surround the nitrogen with five, five electrons. Okay, to make it a new two species. So again, eight minus seven, that gives one. So we have one frontier orbital with one electron in it. So now for AH, it's basically, it's basically the same. So the um, OH fragment, an OH fragment, a nuclear OH fragment, has two electrons in the OH bond, then there are well two electron lone pairs at the at the oxygen. Okay, that gives six, and then you have another uh, electron. Okay, this way so you surround the oxygen with six six valence electrons and make it make it beautiful. Okay, um, so now these three. These three are isolobal, and therefore we should be able to combine them to make stable molecules. Okay, so in order to indicate isolobality, we actually write an arrow with a loop in between those. So this is the typical uh, symbolism for isolobality. Okay, so we can, for instance, combine two CH3 fragments to make a stable molecule with an ethane, known as a stable molecule. We can combine a CH3 with an NH2 fragment, for instance, so that is methylamine, also known as a stable molecule. And we can combine a CH3 fragment with an OH fragment to make methanol. Okay, we can also combine two NH2 fragments that gives the well-known molecule of hydrazine, and we can combine an NH2 fragment with an OH fragment, which gives what is called hydroxylamine, also known. And finally, we can also combine two OH fragments, and that gives well, just hydrogen peroxide. So from that, you can see that we can 
combine isolable fragments to make stable molecules. Works well for main group molecules. Okay, so the same principle also applies for, for instance, six valence electron species. Okay, so a CH2 fragment is a six valence electron species. Okay, we have four electrons in the two CH bonds. In addition, we have two electrons at the carbon, so that the carbon is being surrounded by four electrons and makes a neutral species. The neutral CH2 fragment has uh, two electrons at the carbon. So, therefore, well, how many Fonti orbitals do we have and how many electrons do we have in these Fonti orbitals? Now we have, just to make the calculation, eight minus six, yeah? And that's equal to two. So we expect two Fonti orbitals with two electrons. Okay, one, one electron per Fonti orbit. All right. So now we can again think of isolobal fragments. So the NH fragment would also be a six valence electron fragment. And the O fragment would also be a six valence electron fragment. So the O fragment would in this case not be nothing else but an oxygen atom. Yeah, an oxygen atom has six valence electrons naturally. Okay, um, now we can again make combinations and see if the respective molecules are stable. So if we combine two CH2 fragments, we can make a stable molecule. We can combine a CH2 with an NH fragment, which gives methyl imine, which is known in the gas phase also. Um, and if you combine a CH fragment with an O fragment, then that gives formaldehyde, CH2O, which is also a known fragment. So we can also combine two NH fragments that gives diazine, which is a known inorganic molecule. And we can even combine an NH fragment with an O fragment that gives ether known, um, which is also a known molecule the gas phase. All right, finally, we can even combine two oxygens to make an O2 molecule. Huh? Um, that's of course also stable. Okay, so finally, let's go to five valence electron fragments. So a CH fragment is a five valence electron fragment. So if two electrons a CH bond and three other electrons around the carbon so that we could use a neutral, neutral fragment. So therefore, now we have to make the calculation eight minus five. And that gives three, so we'd expect three Fonti orbitals, three electrons in them. Okay, so we can think of isolobal, uh, Fragments. So if we go from carbon to the nitrogen, well, then a nitrogen atom would be a five valence electron species fragment. Also, and would, we could again make combinations. So, for instance, we could combine two CH fragments to make three bonds between two carbon atoms. And that would give you acetylene. And you could make, well, Dinitrogen out of the two nitrogen atoms, but you could also combine CH and nitrogen, and that would give you hydrogen cyanide. Awesome. That was pieces. Okay, you see that this works well for main group compounds. When we apply the octet rule, and you will see that it works now equally well when we apply this to organometallic fragments as well. It's just that we place the octet rule by the 18 electron rule. But I see we are out of time. So let us stop at this point.